This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Arbalest. At the Word of the Week, we have a bit of a soft spot for the neglected, the mistreated, and the unwanted. Perhaps it's because we grew up in a time when nerdiness was enough to make one a high school social pariah. When video games were things only uber geeks played, and only the very luckiest of kids had Atari consoles. When comic books were something you read under the covers with a flashlight lest you be discovered. And a time when no one believed that a superhero movie that would make you believe a man could fly could make any money at all. These days, nerdiness is everywhere. And all of the hobbies we used to hide are out in the open, and everyone is doing them. At least, everyone on the YouTubes. These days, nerdiness is accessible and approachable. There's a nerdy pastime for everyone. And so, because of our aforementioned weakness for the cast out, for the poor cousins, and the red-headed stepchildren, we got very excited when we finally got around to playing fantasy role-playing horror game Darkest Dungeon and discovered there is an entire class dedicated to wielding crossbows. Not only crossbows, but the baddest of crossbows ever. The Arbalest. See, as fantasy gamers, we're used to seeing crossbows get short shrift in our favorite fantasy games. Everyone loves bows, especially long bows. Everyone wants to be Legolas, or Robin Hood, or William Tell. But we don't want to talk about any of those folks. Or long bows. Maybe some other time. See, we love crossbows, because not only are they soundly unloved and unwanted by most gamers who don't appreciate their virtues, they were also all about accessibility. Now, we should take a moment to talk about Darkest Dungeon, because it's the sort of game many of you listeners would likely enjoy. If we weren't probably the last gamers to play it. And if enjoy weren't the wrong word. Because the game is very stressful. In fact, one of the two central mechanics of the game is all about stress. The other central mechanic is the one that directly inspired the inclusion of the Arbalest. The game was developed by Red Hook Studios for the PC and was released in 2016. But it was really the brainchild of two people, the game's director, Chris Borassa, and the game's lead designer, Tyler Sigman. The two met at their previous job at Backbone Entertainment, a video game company that was itself the result of a merger of several older companies. After several years of trying to make their own project together and getting distracted by other engagements, the pair finally decided it was time to screw their courage to the sticking place, found their own company, and get their game project going. So in April of 2013, they founded Red Hook Studio and began bringing in other talent to help. Now, Darkest Dungeon is a sort of old-schoolish explore-the-dungeon-and-take-turns-hitting-monsters-type RPG. But it has some pretty strong gothic and cosmic horror elements. Heroes are sent into the ruins of an old mansion whose owner dabbled in dark arts and opened a portal he shouldn't have, and tentacles and madness got all over everything. What's interesting about the game, though, is that you aren't the heroes. You're sort of the hero's manager. You send the heroes down into the dungeon, you issue commands, you tell them what to do. But when their minds or bodies get broken, you need to patch them up, send them to the sanitarium, and shove them back into the fray. Or, if they're reduced to a mass of broken bones whose medical expenses are too steep to cover, or if they're reduced to a gibbering vegetable beyond the help of any psychiatrist or self-destructive escapist drinking binge, you dump them in higher replacements. And that's the stress and sanity mechanic that a lot of people have made a lot of noise about. But the other important mechanic, and in fact one that predated the whole stress thing, is the rank and positioning system. See, Barasa and Sigmund had been spitballing ideas for years before they finally got their company started, and one of their major inspirations was classic computer RPGs that included The Bard's Tale, 
or rather, Michael Cranford's Tales of the Unknown, colon, volume one, colon, The Bard's Tale. Yeah, the original name was a bit subtitle happy. Which is why most people only remember it as The Bard's Tale. Now, we've talked about that classic video game before, and when it first came out in 1985, it was the sort of game that only the nerdiest of nerds would play. It was a complex, stat-based, dungeon-crawling RPG, which to some extent was responsible for popularizing the idea of bards as singers of magical buffing songs in RPGs. The reason we bring it up is because the game had a system in which characters in the front ranks of the party would suffer more damage from enemy attacks, whereas characters in the back ranks would be more protected, but their options would be more limited. Which also became a popular mechanic in turn-based stat-driven RPGs. But what Barassa and Sigmund lamented was that the game didn't do very much with it. And most games with rank-based systems didn't either. You planted a character in the front row or the back row and they would receive a damage and defense buff or nerf based on their position. Done and done. They thought it would be neat if the choice was more complex, more dynamic, and required adaptation. So they came up with a positioning system in which different abilities could be used only from certain positions in the party. And abilities could only target certain positions in the enemy party. And they came up with reasons to change position. A character might have attack abilities usable only from the front, but a healing ability usable only from the back. So if they want to heal the party, they might have to jockey themselves into a back position first. Characters might have abilities to shove enemies into different positions, and enemies might pull the heroes out of their favorite positions to make them more vulnerable. It was this complex, dynamic positioning system that led them to abandon the game's original top-down tile view in favor of the side view. And that allowed the game's signature art style to shine. And it was also that position that led them to consider different ranges of attack. Short, medium, long, and variable. And to look at their options for different ranged weapons than the usual fantasy fair. Which brings us to the Arbalest that got us so excited. An Arbalest is basically a kind of super crossbow that was developed in the late medieval period and represented a substantial improvement over the earlier crossbow. But before we talk about that, we should make sure we all know what a crossbow is. A crossbow is a projectile weapon that involves mounting a curved bow, called a prod, horizontally on a wooden stock called a tiller. The string of the bow is pulled back along the top of the tiller and held in place by a catch called a nut. An arrow-like bolt or quarrel is set into a slot in front of the string. When the lever or trigger, called a tickler, is depressed, the nut is released and the string propels the quarrel along the tiller and then through the air and then through the enemy. Called a quarrel magnet or, or something. Now, the crossbow gets a lot of flack because it's generally perceived as a slow weapon. And it was. But its slowness was due to one of the crossbow's two major advantages. See, because the archer didn't have to manually draw the bow string back and hold it in place before releasing, the bow could have a much higher pull. And that has to do with elasticity. See, the reason a bow, any bow, works is because the material it's made out of is highly elastic. If you bend it out of shape and then let it go, it will return to its original shape, quickly and powerfully. When you pull a bowstring back and consequently bend the bow out of shape, the bow wants to snap back into shape. And when it does, it pulls the string with it. And the string pushes the arrow through the air, launching it at your enemy. The higher the restoring force, the force with which the bow pulls itself back to its original shape, the more power it takes to bend it back in the first place. Because of the design of the crossbow, you don't need to use your muscles to continue to apply the pulling force until the moment you fire. You can pull the string back, hook it around the nut, and then it's stuck in place until you're ready to shoot. So the pull of the bow can be much higher than that of a traditional bow. And once crossbowyers, or artillators, the terms for folks that make crossbows, figured that out, they started to get creative to allow even more power. 
For example, they fitted a stirrup on the front of the crossbow. You stuck your foot through that and held the tip of the crossbow to the ground. Then you pulled the string back with both hands. That meant the pull could be twice as high as a traditional bow, which is always drawn with one hand. Or you could build a lever onto the crossbow or as a separate device that would help you pull the string back. Or you could have a device called a winch, or krannikin, which consisted of a screw and a winch. You turned the winch, and it would pull the string along the screw and back into place. The end result of all these innovations was that you could build bows that required much more force to pull than a human being could ever exert with one arm. And thus the bolt or quarrel had much more power and penetration than the best bows of the time. And that allowed artillators of the 12th century CE in Europe to do something with a crossbow they could never do with a traditional bow. They could make the bow itself out of steel. See, steel is stronger and more elastic than wood. You can apply a much higher force to deform it without breaking it, and it will snap back with a lot of power. But it'd also take a lot of strength to bend a substantially thick steel bow. Now, with the help of a Kranikin, a human could wind back the string of an oversized steel crossbow. And that's what an arbalest was. An arbalest could send a coral through the air with the equivalent of 5,000 pounds of force, enough to punch through the best armors and the person inside of it. And an arbalest was accurate up to almost 1,000 feet, whereas a traditional crossbow was accurate to about 600 feet. And sure, they were slow to reload. A trained arbalester could fire off two shots a minute. And modern recreationists have demonstrated the ability to fire up to eight bolts from a hand-pulled crossbow in a minute. That's, of course, assuming you were firing at a mass, like a charging army, and weren't taking much time to aim. Either way, the crossbow wasn't as slow as most people think it was. But it was still slower than a traditional bow. More importantly, though, when it comes to the disadvantages of the crossbow was the fact that crossbows were complex mechanical devices. They were hard to build and consequently hard to come by, and that's the main reason they weren't more widespread. And they would have been, because crossbows had a major advantage over traditional bows. They were easy to use. Relatively untrained soldiers, such as peasants pressed into service, could be handed crossbows and taught how to point them in roughly the right direction and loose their ammunition and be pretty damned effective, even against armored or mounted targets. It took years of training and muscle conditioning to become effective with a traditional bow, and that made a big difference. Now, despite the complexity of the devices involved, crossbows are actually a lot older than people realize, especially if you count the word from which the name arbalest is partially derived. See, arbalest comes from two words, Arcus, which is Latin for bow, and ballista, which is Latin for launch or hurl. And throughout a lot of historical records, the word ballista, crossbow, and even arbalest are used somewhat interchangeably. But if we want to be technical, a ballista is not a crossbow. So there are similarities. A ballista is a large crossbow-like device that launches large spear-like or harpoon-like projectiles at different targets. It is what we might call a siege weapon. Interestingly, the ballista predated the crossbow because it's easier to make things big than make them small. The first mention of the ballista in any historical record actually comes from the Bible. In the second book of Chronicles, chapter 26, verse 15, King Uzziah commissioned great engines of war to be made in Jerusalem and to be mounted on walls and towers to hurl great arrows and large stones. The reign of King Uzziah happened somewhere around 780 BCE, so it's fair to say that's when the first ballista were a thing. But as for who invented the handheld, person-sized, individually selectable crossbow, well, we aren't sure. No, this is not a failure of research here. We're not saying we at the Word of the Week aren't sure. We're saying nobody knows. Not for sure. See, according to tradition, this guy from the Chu state of China, named Qin Shi, is recorded with inventing the crossbow in the 6th century BCE. 
but linguists are skeptical, because the early words for the crossbow used in Chinese writings seem to be derived from borrowed words. That is, the name seems to come from some other similar, but not ancient, Chinese language. We're glossing over the fine details here. We're not linguists. The point is that the original name of the crossbow isn't precisely a Chinese name, and that suggests it was invented by someone China adjacent. But then we're also talking about the 6th century BCE, so China was a lot smaller, it was changing a lot, and it had a lot of neighboring clans, tribes, and cultures that it would later absorb. Perhaps we're just picking nits. But the crossbow definitely caught on in China. The first recorded and confirmed use of crossbows on the battlefield comes from 341 BCE, when the armies of the Qi state and the Wei state came into conflict at the Battle of Ma Ling. Sun Pin, the leader of the Qi armies, used his crossbow troops to such good effect that the Wei were routed under the onslaught. And under the Zhao dynasty, the second major ruling dynasty of China, not counting the possibly legendary ones, the Imperial Army maintained elite crossbow units that became famous throughout the region. This was actually the second Zhao dynasty. See, there was a Western Zhao dynasty and an Eastern Zhao dynasty. It was during that period, under the rule of Dong Zhao or Eastern Zhao, between 770 BCE and 256 BCE, that the crossbow got props from one of its biggest celebrity fanboys ever who also happens to be one of the most renowned military tacticians and writers ever. Well, maybe. Because just like no one knows who actually invented the first crossbow, no one knows who Sun Tzu really was. And that's what's next. Sun Tzu and his masterwork on military strategy, tactics, and apparently business management, the art of war. In case you couldn't guess. Now, Sun Tzu is not actually Sun Tzu, and we say that for two reasons. First, because Tzu is actually a title, an honorific, it means master, he's Master Sun. And his real name is Sun Wu. According to legend, he was born in the Qi State in eastern China along the Yellow Sea and served as a military advisor to King Ho Lu, and he wrote a book called Ping Fa, The Art of War probably sometime in the 4th or 5th century BCE, if he existed. See, although there have been some recent archaeological finds that provide a bit of evidence for some of this, the fact is, it's all a bunch of historical hearsay, and there's still some question as to whether Sun Tzu existed at all, and who really wrote the art of war. So keep that in mind when we tell you the story of how Sun Tzu supposedly got the job of military advisor. What you have to understand is that China was in a period known as the Spring and Autumn Period. While it was technically under the rule of the Eastern Zhao Imperial Dynasty, the Emperor was losing power. The Zhao had maintained power over their comparatively large empire with a system of complex alliances and pledges of loyalty that were basically Chinese feudalism. But things were falling apart because the rulers of all the little local states were realizing they held most of the military power. In addition to vying for power amongst themselves, many of China's vassal states were also increasing their wealth by conquering neighboring territories. And lots of those vassal states ended up trying to conquer the same territories. It was getting ugly. At the same time, though, under the Zhao dynasty, there was also a big cultural explosion happening. To maintain its relevance, the imperial dynasty was undergoing massive public works projects. Canals, dams, roads, all sorts of stuff. And spirituality, culture, and society were also changing drastically. That's partially why it's called the Spring and Autumn Period. In some ways, it was a period of cultural and social growth. Spring. And in other ways, it was a period of political decline. Autumn. It was also called that because another author of the time wrote about it in his historical chronicles and compared different events of the time to different seasons especially spring and autumn. His name was Confucius, but we don't have time to go into him now. So basically, there was a lot of conflict happening and military expertise was much sought after. And lots of folks were talking about this one guy, Sun Tzu. Well, Sun Wu, but we covered that. 
And the king of one state, King Aholu, heard about him and wanted to see if he was really as good as everyone said. So he gave Sung Tzu a little test. He gave Sung Tzu a harem of royal concubines to train his soldiers. If Sung Tzu could turn the concubines into disciplined soldiers, the king would hire him as a military advisor. So Sung Tzu worked really hard and trained the concubines night and day and day and night. And it was a disaster. The courtesans were an undisciplined mess. So, Sung Tzu picked out the king's two favorite concubines and beheaded them in front of the king and in front of all the other concubines. And after that, the concubines followed every order to the letter. Wouldn't you? And so Sung Tzu got the job. Anyway, we bring him up because among all of the topics in the art of war that Sung Tzu covers about tactics, strategy, logistics, supplies, management, discipline, and so on, he writes about the crossbow a lot. And not just as a weapon of war. He also uses it in several analogies about motivation and decision making. The Art of War has been in print pretty much ever since, and it is the most read book on military strategy in the world, in every corner of the world. And, relatively recently given its long history, it has become a favorite book for executives, managers, business students, and trial lawyers. We had to read it ourselves when we earned our accounting degree. And it is amazing how a 2,500-year-old book about ancient warfare still has lessons for modern strategic thinking off the battlefield. And how approachable it is. How accessible. It's an effective weapon anyone can use to hone their skills. Kind of like the poor maligned crossbow. So you can be Legolas if you want to. We'll stick to being Sung Tzu. Except, you know, without beheading any concubines, some lessons are better left in the past. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Thank you.